Thank you, and good morning. Um, I'm going to start out, actually, Jason had talked a little bit about uh, change happens from a personal experience to an institutional level and from the heart. And uh, that's how my journey started. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, I have two twins. They're 15 years old right now, um, two boys. And uh, Harrison, the first one that you'll hear about, is uh, a great student in school. He's been in independent schools his whole life. Um, he loves learning, um, or he did love learning in school, and uh, he was not a behavior problem, he had no learning issues, and probably around eighth or ninth grade, he said, you know, Mom, um, I think I want to be on an online school. And my husband and I were not prepared for that choice. We had been in um, the world of independent education, and we looked at our public schools, so I asked him a little bit about why, and he said he really wanted to love the computer, he wanted to learn on his own, and he wanted to learn on his own pace. And I realized at that moment that he had never asked for anything in school. He just did as he was told, and he did all the right things. So we said yes. And um, he started about two years ago online, and he's in a virtual school, and um, he talks about being able to learn anywhere, anytime, and he says even on his phone. He also talks about learning without a teacher. But the most significant piece about his experience, he says the absence of a teacher makes you rely more on yourself and makes you a more independent learner. And with more independence, you can eventually teach yourself about any topic you desire to learn. That is significant for me, because that is exactly what I wanted for him. And uh, his new venture, actually, is he's building his own computer right now. So he's learned a lot about himself as a learner. And I'm really happy he's had that experience. He put himself in charge. If you have children, or more than one children, you'll probably realize that they're not all the same. So his twin brother um, is a very different kind of learner. His name's Everett, he's also 15 years old. Um, and early on, he was diagnosed with ADD and some auditory processing, and he had some language issues. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the best learning environment for him was. And we soon realized that he really needed a school that he could be face-to-face -face with a teacher. He needed a school where he had someone who understood his learning needs. And we found a wonderful school for him where that uses technology a lot. It uses a lot of assistive technology. So he was very familiar with LiveScribe and DragonSpeak and audiobooks. And so he had a great opportunity to be able to be very confident with technology and see technology as a way that could really help him. He has had to work hard in school, different than Harrison, in everything he's done. And so because he's had to work so hard, he gets very, very frustrated when adults around him, including his mother, are constantly asking him questions about things we don't know how to do on the computer or on our iPhone. Um, so the other day, he said to me, you know, Mom, I might have ADD, but you have LTD. And I thought, LTD? That's, what is that? And he said, that's learning technology disorder. And of course, I looked at him and I said, that's not real, is it? And I felt like Googling it, like, do I really have this? So when I asked him what it was, he says, adults can be annoying sometimes. They're always asking for tech help instead of just trying to figure it out for themselves. Why don't they just try? And I thought about that a lot because I kept on thinking, that's what we want with our kids in the classroom. We don't want them to rely on someone else. We want them to use their brain to engage. We want them to take a risk. And I didn't realize that I was modeling for him a lot all the time when I asked him for help. I wasn't doing my homework. I wasn't trying to figure out first. Why? Because it takes longer. Why? Because he's better at it. And um, I realized what he expected of me is to work just as hard as he has had to work in learning something new. So I carried that with me. My journey continued on to something that was very different. Um, I've been in independent schools as a teacher. I've been an administrator and now head of school. And I've always thought about university teaching. So about five years ago, I was approached by um, someone at St. Joe's University and asked me if I wanted to teach this class. 
It's a higher level class um, for uh, graduate school students, and the brain research and the cognitive studies did not bother me. That was an area that I'd really specialized in. So I was really eager to say yes, but I was really concerned. I had two uh, you know, young kids at the time, and I had a full job as an administrator, and I didn't want to go to a university two or three times a night and teach a class. So I said, you know, it sounds like a great opportunity, but it's just not right for me. And um, the dean of the program said, well, it's an online class, and you can do it anytime and anywhere. And I said, well, that's great, but I don't know how to teach an online class, and I've never done that before. And she said, well, we have a class on that. And I said, well, that's great. So I said, when does that meet? Is that two or three times? Um, do I have to come to campus? And she said, no, we have an online class to teach you. And I said, you have an online class to teach me how to teach an online class? She said, we do. So of course, I thought about Everett and thought, oh boy, this is going to be a problem because I'm going to need help with this. And I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. And I can't ask him for help. So I decided to, to delve in and um, teach this class. And it was a spectacular learning experience for me because I had never taken an online class. I'd never taught one. And I didn't know even how to do that. Um, and five years later, I'm very happy to say that doing my work on my own and being able to ask my kids for some help, I'm able to, to really learn um, the beauty of that. Um, in the schools that I was working, there was a lot of technology changes going on. At that time, we were starting a one-to-one -one program, and I thought that was a fabulous opportunity as well. And it was the first time I actually took a, a MOOC, Massive Online Open Software course. The way I was introduced to that course was through a young teacher who I had hired for my new venture. And as I was interviewing him, and you know, I always say you, you got to get a good millennial on your team because he was telling me about the course that he was going to take this summer. And it was leaders in learning, and it was a Harvard professor, and it was going to be a great course. And of course, I said, wow, that sounds wonderful. I'd really like to take a course like that. And he said, why don't you take it with me? And I thought, well, OK, here we go again. So I dived in, and I took this course, and I loved it. And what I did um, the next summer is instead of giving our faculty summer reading, we all took an online course together. So it was a wonderful opportunity. So that brings me to the lobby of this building, which is a brand new school, opened three years ago. It's called YSC Academy. YSC is the Youth so Soccer Corporation Academy. Um, what happened in this venture, which is where I am right now, is I was approached by the owner of the Philadelphia Union, which is the pro soccer team in Philadelphia, which I had never heard about. And um, he said, you know, I have this, this money that I want to invest in um, getting America to really win the first World Cup. And I want to see these kids be able to train, and they have a passion for soccer. And in this country, they have to really make a choice between soccer and education. And I have this great sports science complex. And I would love to hire you to be able to create a program. So I don't play soccer. Never coached soccer, not a soccer mom. And I only watched the World Cup once, and that was last time it was on. And, but I thought, who am I to stand in the world of a possible World Cup for our country? Um, knowing that, you know, the other story was everybody would graduate, everybody would go to college, and this could be a great opportunity. So I, it was not uh, hard to say, but I said yes. But after I said yes, I thought, wow, how do you start a school? I've been fortunate enough to be in schools that are 100 years, 200 years, 300 years old. How do I start a school? And what I realized very quickly is when you begin to start a school, you have to be very clear about what you're going to do. And so this school was the intersection of academics and athletics. And I knew when we brought these two things together, we were starting with students who had a passion for athletics. They'd been playing soccer their whole life. And my job was to really help formulate a passion for learning. We knew that the education had to be mobile, it had to be flexible, because our students traveled quite a, quite a bit, and they needed to be able to be online. So we decided to do something very unique. We did create a school, um, and we have some face-to-face -face classes with some blended learning. We also have virtual learning. But we decided to say, 
I'm not really sure who's going to be better on a virtual learning class or with a blended We are going to decide um, what we need to offer from a high school perspective, but we're going to let the students decide if they want to take biology online or biology in the classroom. And they might know best because maybe math is something that's difficult for them and they need a teacher, but English is something they want to work at their own pace and they can be able to work um, in a virtual environment. So that's what we did. And we gave um, our students a lot of choice and it was a wonderful thing. Teachers in the classroom that we had hired also used online platform. And they did a lot of flipped classroom and blended learning. But they really wanted to start out with the idea that if these students had a passion for soccer, and you wanted them to really get a passion for learning, we had to meet them halfway. And so um, this is our physics teacher. And she uh, decided that she was going to, in her unit on physics, um, projectile motion and kinematics, she was going to be able to take the kids out to the pitch, the soccer field, and she was going to have them kick the ball and get to that goal. And then she was going to teach them physics, kinematics, projectile motion. And she was going to see if they could improve their shot. And she was going to collect that data. And we have very competitive kids. And so, of course, once they went out and did it on their own, and then they learned a lot about the arc of the ball and how fast it goes, they were able to really um, see how using and understanding physics could really help them. And it goes back to the question that they would ask all the time, where when am I going to use this in the real world? And so it was a great opportunity for them. Um, it was actually published in a science manual um, or science journal a while ago. So it's been a, a nice longitudinal project for the three years that we've been um, in progress. Um, the young teacher who is the millennial that I mentioned is our English teacher. And he. Um, had a really strong bent that he wanted his students in English to be able to really write for an audience. He did not want them to be able to just write papers for him. And he really believed in social media, so he decided he wanted to do a lot of blogging. And he used the Little Book of Talent, which was a really wonderful book for our student athletes by Daniel Coyle, and they have many tips. The thing that's most interesting about this tip 22, which is thinking in images, is probably the last statement um, from this boy who's now at Duquesne University playing soccer. Um, but he wrote that trying to figure out the next move on the soccer field, always, always using that technique to visualize, he would do that as a very young age. And he says, I always found myself thinking in pictures and seeing things in the world that I knew for sure others did not see. And seeing such things is a great gift. And that was a wonderful way for him to be able to realize that higher level soccer is not about just thinking what to do next. It's about visualizing and scanning and being able to, like a chess player, think three steps ahead. So it was a great vehicle for him to um, use soccer and these tips and blogging to make sense of it all. So in our school, we had to create a program where our soccer players could be able to uh, train twice during the day and be able to have an education in the middle of the day. And so we know a lot about adolescents, and adolescents really don't start out in the morning wanting to wake up. They need their neurons waked up. So they, um, we ended up putting our soccer training in the morning, which we know is a great thing for adolescents to be able to get up and move. We made sure that after they trained, they'd have hydration and nutrition. And we worked with Adidas to be able to create a program that allowed our student athletes to be able to be very self-aware of their body, self-aware of their educational needs. So Generation Adidas, who had team with us, um, came in to work with our students um, with marketing research, right? So there's all these cleats that are available. And we wanted our students um, to be able to be good spokesmen. We wanted them to be able to use their digital skills. And um, we wanted them also to be able to look at who they represented as they went out into the soccer world. So they had many opportunities to be able to look at these new cleats and be able to decide what worked and what didn't. But they had a couple of restrictions, right? They needed to use social media. They needed to work in teams. And we actually had people from E3 and Generation Adidas come out and um, help them devise some commercials on these things so they can kind of put them out. So it was a really great experience. They also provided us for that soccer unit a um, Generation Adidas soccer ball that has a digital chip in it that allows you to record how fast you hit the ball. And that was a tremendous thing for us as well. 
So what does it mean to be a game changer for me? What it meant is to look at what really made me believe that education needed to change, what made me believe um, that I could start a soccer school when I knew nothing about soccer. It made me understand that listening to students is a central piece of what we need to do. Trusting your students, there's not a lot of people that trust adolescents, but trusting them to have a voice and choice in their education was a wonderful thing for us and allowed half the work or more than half the work to be done with their motivation. Taking a risk, um, I would say I take risks every day and the bigger risks I take, the more risks my teachers take and the more risks the students take. I think they feel like if I can take a risk and I can handle it, then I'm going to be more supportive of them. Student choice and voice is really critical. Um, schools are built for teachers and populations, and thinking about building a school for student athletes means really having some empathy to understand what does a student athlete need. And um, giving students voice in their education, deciding if they can choose they can't choose all of which classes they need to um, take. They set, definitely can choose how they want to take them. And finally, don't be afraid to lead. Sometimes you're going to be the only one in the room with a crazy idea, and you have to be there. And don't be afraid to fail. And those are the things that I've learned. Thank you.